Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in this world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. My name is Charlene O'Hanlon. I am the moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will be receiving a link after the webinar today that will take you to the event on demand. And we are also taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during the webinar you have a question for our panelists, please just use your GoToWebinar control panel, submit your question, and we'll take probably about eh, 15 minutes or so near the end of the event, and we'll go over the audience questions then. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and dive right on into today's webinar, Performance is a Shape, Not a Number. Our speaker today is Kay Osterhout, who's Software Engineer at Lightstep. Hi, Kay, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Charlene. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you and let you do your thing. Great, thank you. So today we'll be talking about performance and specifically looking at how you can understand performance of complicated software systems. Typically when you start asking people, what are the things that you do to understand the performance of your systems? People typically respond with these three pillars of observability as they're sometimes called. They say they look at metrics, they measure things like latency and throughput of components of their system. They have tools for logging so that they can search through their logs, for example, when something goes wrong. And they talk about having distributed tracing where they have these traces that show them how requests propagate through the different parts of their system. So people talk about these three really valuable pieces of data that they use to understand their system. But then if you ask them a follow-up question of, okay, so do you actually understand what's going on with their system? People often say no. And instead they often describe this feeling of feeling sort of crushed by all of these sources of data that they're trying to untangle. Here at LightStep, we think that as you're thinking about performance, rather than thinking about these sources of data, it's more helpful to think about observability in terms of these two things that you actually do with the data. There's these two fundamental activities, um, that's what you use logs and metrics and distributed tracing for, which are first to measure things and second to explain. So first I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by measuring and explaining, and then I'll talk more about why each of these activities is hard. So first, measuring. When I say symptom measurement, what I mean by this is what, what happened? What are the things that you're concerned about in the system? To give a couple of examples of what that might be, a really common measurement that you would look at is performance experienced by your end user. For example, when a user visits your website, how long does it take for the page to load? Or if they run some kind of transaction, how long does it take for it to complete? With large engineering organizations, another common measurement that teams are looking at are these per service commitments that they've made to other groups, uh, service level indicators, SLIs, or SLOs. Um, so this is often necessary if you've broken your system into a bunch of microservices and a bunch of other teams are depending on something that my team has built, uh, and we would like to make sure that our team is providing the guarantees that we promised to others. People also common, commonly measure various um, sort of breakdowns of their systems, like if they have a particular high value customer, a lot of software as a service has a small number of customers that drive a lot of their revenue, so it's very important to make sure that those customer accounts are experiencing good performance. People might run experiments as they're trying uh, new changes to the software to see if they improve performance, looking at the performance of blue-green deploys, um, et cetera, et cetera. There are many different things that you might measure about your system. So that's measurement. The second activity that people talk about is explaining. Uh, this is asking what happened typically when one of those symptoms goes wrong. So to provide a couple of examples of what I mean by explaining, uh, one explanation you might have is, okay, the latency spiked, um, and that's because some customers are experiencing cash misses. Or maybe the explanation is that there was a commit in yesterday's deploy that introduced a memory leak, uh, and that's why the system's running slowly today. Another common explanation is that something was wrong with the system configuration, some parameter was set incorrectly. So these are the two fundamental activities that we think of. And once you have thought of observability in terms of these activities, I think it's easier to understand why it's difficult uh, because each of these activities is made very difficult by the sheer volume of data that people have in their systems. 
So I'll talk a little bit more now about why each of these things is hard. First, why is it hard to do measurement? In order to describe why measurement is hard, I'm going to take a brief detour to go on a history of how people have measured performance in these systems historically. So if you rewind back to 2002 or so and ask how did people measure performance and what did their applications typically look like? Typically in 2002, people's applications were a single monolith running on bare metal, running on a server somewhere, and the thing that they measured was average response latency over time. The graph that I'm showing here is a pretty boring looking graph. You almost can't tell that there's a line there because the average latency is very low uh, and it's pretty much flat over time. Now, measuring average latency is making some implicit assumptions. The first is that the latency is normally distributed or close to it. And the reason that that assumption is important is because that assumption is necessary if average latency is meaningful. The only reason that we think average latency is meaningful is because we think it's in the middle of this normal distribution that describes the performance that most of the users are experiencing. The other assumption of average, average latency is that it's a leading indicator of problems. If something's going wrong in my system, I'm assuming that the average latency will tell me about it. And back in 2002, this was mostly true. Uh, sim systems were simpler, there was one big monolith running, and so there was this sort of one um, characteristic group of performance that you could describe using an average. Now fast forward about 10 years to so 2012, and systems were starting to look pretty different. Instead of just having one monolith running, there was typically a monolith that was relying on a lot of other managed services. It was becoming increasingly common to have these high fan out services that relied on a bunch of other components um, to return a result to the user. If you start thinking about performance in these systems, the dynamics are pretty different. So to walk through a particular example, suppose that you have a service that provides one millisecond latency on average, so this service is very fast but it has one second 99th percentile latency. So 1% of the time, the latency of this service is gonna be a second or more. This sounds pretty good if you think about it, um, just sort of from the get-go, if you use only one of these services, 1% of your requests will take more than a second, but most of the requests will be fast. The reason why dynamics of performance measurement changed is because it became common to use more of these services. So now suppose you relied on 100, on 100 of these services, suddenly you have 100 services that each are slow one percentage of the time. So if you uh, multiply out the likelihood of your request taking more than a second, if you're depending on 100 services, suddenly 63% of your requests are slow. So for this reason, the way that people thought about performance changed. Instead of thinking about average latency, people started to measure P99 response latency. And one of the reasons for this, as I just talked about, was because 99th percentile latency actually became an important predictor of performance for users. This is a graph of uh, uh, the same service that I showed earlier that had low median latency or low average latency. And here what you can see is that the 99th percentile latency is telling a more interesting story. It's jumping around a bit more over time and telling us more about what the users may actually be experiencing. There are a couple of assumptions underlying the use of P99 latency, not dissimilar to the assumptions when we were looking at average. The first assumption is still that latency distributions have a single behavior, that they have this single, probably normal distribution, and we're assuming that what we're measuring is this sort of thinking face on that one leading end of the behavior. Um, we're measuring that 99th percentile. But we're still assuming that there's really only one group of behavior and we're just tracking the high percentile of that behavior because it can predict when there's problems and it tells us something about user performance. Now, fast forward to today when users, when people are running these distributed systems made up of a large number of microservices, and it's pretty rare to see a latency distribution that looks normal. This is a sample of a bunch of different latency distributions that we pulled from one of the systems that we run internally at LightStep. And we didn't go looking for weird distributions when we did this. We just picked a couple of the common operations in our system uh, and we screenshotted the latency histogram. What you're looking at here, in case you're not familiar with looking at histograms, is along the x-axis is the duration that a particular operation took. Um, so, for example, on the right side, each bar is representing operations that took one seconds or 10 seconds or higher. 
And then the y-axis is describing the number of things that took that amount of time. So in general, so when things are further to the right, that's sort of bad because that's slower. And when you see higher bars, that's saying that more, um, more examples in the system took that amount of time. Now, the takeaway from these graphs should be that you don't often see distribution that's distributions that are normal today. It's much more typical to see distributions that look like this, where you have a number of different sort of bumps or modes of behavior um, that each describe a distinctly different behavior in your system. So these re real world latency distributions are multimodal. And the reason for that is because today's microservice architectures have a bunch of different combinations of behaviors that can occur. As you have many different systems running, there are a combinatorial number of ways that these systems can interact, and those will each manifest as these different clusters of behavior if you look at the complete latency distribution. So they're also not at all normally distributed because you have many different groups of behavior. Now, you may be wondering why you haven't seen these and if that means they're not useful. The reason that these latency distributions are often not shown is because they're computationally much more difficult to generate than a percentile. You can generate a percentile by sampling the data, but in, normal, in order to show this complete latency distribution, you need to be able to see all of your data. So as a result, these latency distributions are rarely seen. Here's an example of what it might look like to measure performance when you do have a latency distribution. Uh, this is what you can do with LightSteps Live View. And here, having a, the complete unsampled latency distribution allows you to identify distinctly different performance behaviors. I'll talk about a couple more examples of how this is useful later in this talk. So to recap, measuring is hard. The first reason that I talked a bunch about is that latency is complicated. It used to be okay to measure average percent, average latency or median latency. Then we moved towards 99th percentile latency, but still looking at one number. And with the complexity of today's systems, it no longer is sufficient to look at just a single number. It's critical to see this complete latency histogram in order to understand the different behaviors that are occurring in your system. There are a couple of other reasons why measuring is hard that I won't talk about in a lot of detail today, but just to cover them briefly, a second reason is that cardinality makes things much more difficult. Typically, when you're looking at behavior, you want to be able to filter that behavior um, by different tags in your system. For example, one thing that I talked about earlier is that you might want to filter the behavior by different customers. The high cardinality of these things starts to make things very difficult. For example, if you have some number of customers and then each of those customers may have a couple of different flags, um, the explosion of number of things that you might need to search for makes it very difficult to provide these sort of complete histograms for all things that a particular um, developer may be interested in. The final reason that measuring is hard is that interactivity is critical. One way that you could sort of easily um, get measurement is you could save a bunch of data and then do some slow analysis later. Um, or you could have a system where you tell it exactly what you need to measure and then only after you tell it that does it start measuring this. But for anyone that's been debugging something, when you're having a performance problem or a production issue, it's not, it, it sort of is a deal breaker if you have to add a new metric and then wait for the metric to be deployed and start collecting things it's critical to be able to explore things on the fly in order to understand what's going on. So this is why measuring is hard. Now I mentioned these two fundamental activities, measuring and explaining, and unfortunately explaining is even harder. And the kind of key underlying reason why this explaining is difficult is because there's so much data that you're getting from the measurements. That leads to a couple of challenges. The first is that correlation and causation are not the same. I'm sure most folks listening have probably been in the scenario where you're trying to debug some performance problem and you have 10 graphs that all show the same problem. They all have some spike in latency, for example, that happens at a particular point in time. But unfortunately, it's usually difficult to determine which one of those things is actually the cause versus which one of those things was just correlated. Another reason why it's difficult to explain behavior is because one big factor in performance problems is often contention, that there are many requests that are happening at the same time and they're all competing for resources. Contention is tricky because it's often impossible to see. It's this sort of invisible hand that controls performance. Um, and it's very difficult to see unless your tools are giving you the right information. 
The final reason that explaining is difficult is because it's hard to know what's normal. These systems typically have very complicated behavior. There are almost always some outliers, and it can be difficult to tell whether the behavior you're seeing that looks weird is something that's related to the current problem or if it's something that just happens normally. Now, it's tempting to look at all of these problems and think, like, surely I can solve these problems. Why don't I add a bunch more metrics to my system? This graph tries to get at why that's difficult. If you graph a couple of things in terms of the number of microservices in your system, that flat blue line on the bottom is the number of user visible symptoms. Those are things like uh, a particular customer's latency is slow. And these symptoms are great for time series metrics. They don't scale a lot with the number of microservices that you've decomposed your system into. Now that scarier looking purple line is the number of plausible root causes. This thing grows combinatorially with the number of microservices because as you have more different services, there are more different ways that those services can interact to cause problems. Now, the issue with that is that it no longer makes sense to have time series metrics for every root cause. Even if you could come up with a metric that described every root cause that could occur, there would be far too many of those metrics for people to possibly look at when things went wrong, and they would have this sort of signal-to-noise problem where it was hard to tell what the cause was and which things were just correlated. So there's a fundamental challenge of explaining, which is that there's just too much data. Now let me walk through what it looks like to explain uh, using a tool that that steers you towards the correct explanation. This is what it might look like to explain something with light steps live view. The first thing that we're looking at here is a latency histogram, just like we looked at before. So along the x-axis is the duration of a particular operation that I've searched for in the top left. This is an operation called user space mapping. That's something that's important to end user performance. And then each one of these bars is a count of the number of times that the operation took that particular amount of time. So what I can see right away from looking at this histogram is that there's these kind of two different distinct behaviors that are occurring in the system. And so having these detailed latency measurements has already sort of steered me towards an explanation because I've been able to cluster the things that are happening into these two groups. There's that one group of behavior on the left side and a second group of behavior on the right side. So already I have somewhat of an explanation that there are two things that are happening that are different. Now, another important part of getting to the right explanation that I mentioned is being able to have interactive access to the data, being able to filter on high cardinality tags in order to explain what's going on. So here I've added the tag for a particular customer. Um, this is sort of dummy data, uh, but there's a customer called BMO here. And you can see that if you filter to this particular customer, I've already been able to explain that one part of that behavior can be ascribed to just one customer. So I can do this live filtering to check a hypothesis that I have about the data. Now, another critical part of explaining is being able to filter to find the data that you want. Part of that was adding the, being able to filter the histogram like I did before um, when I added the customer ID of BMO. But here I can also filter to get the right data. Maybe I only care about the things that are slow. Uh, so here what I've done is filtered to a particular part of the histogram, and I'm seeing a bunch of examples here along the bottom uh, for operations that took that amount of time. I can zoom into one of those operations to get a trace of what's going on. I won't talk much about traces in this talk, but just to give you a sense of what's going on here, what you're looking at along the top is time progressing from left to right, and then each horizontal bar is showing the time for one operation in my system. So first, I have an operation called proxy relay that's in an API proxy service, and then that calls reserve asset, which calls authentication runner, and so on. And then here in blue, the user space mapping operation, that's what's in the histogram, is what's highlighted. Um, and what I can see from looking at this trace, if you look at the logs along the right-hand side, to answer my question of, you know, why was user space mapping slower? What can I do to make it faster? Here I'm seeing some logs that tell me that for this particular operation, uh, there was a cache reconnection, uh, so there was some kind of timeout. And as a result, that user space mapping operation took a little bit over a second. Now, what was important in this exploration was not just that I got more data. It wasn't that I looked at a bunch more time series metrics, for example. What was important is that I was steered toward the right data to get an explanation that could help me understand what was going on. 
in this case, I wanted to see the data for a particular customer, and I wanted to see one of the slow traces so that I could dig into what was making that trace slow. The final piece of functionality that I'll talk about that helps in explanations is historical layers. These are critical for helping to separate the signal from the noise to understand which behaviors I should be expecting and which ones are actually worrisome. I'll talk about a more concrete example of this in a couple of minutes, uh, but here what you can see along the right hand side is I checked a week ago and I can see that this behavior was the same a week ago. That yellow line is tracing the same outline as the current histogram, so this slow behavior that I'm seeing isn't something that was newly introduced, it's been around for a while. This kind of historical information can be very helpful for debugging, especially as you're trying to narrow down when a problem started occurring. So to recap the challenges that I've talked about so far, uh, I've talked about today's systems being very complex and that requires two things. The first is high precision measurement, which you can get with detailed latency histograms. These high precision measurements are necessary because a single number is not sufficient to characterize the complex performance that you see in systems today. Then the second action that I need help with is explanations and today's systems require help with doing that not just giving me more data, but giving me data that steers me towards the right insights. So with this context of thinking about these two critical activities, measuring and explaining, I wanna talk about a more detailed example of a production problem that happened recently and how we used measurement and explanation to understand what was going on. So I'll talk about this example where somebody reported recently that the page load was slow. One thing I'd like to emphasize about this process before I walk through this example is that typically part of exploring any symptom that's going wrong is a bunch of explanations that are not correct. And a critical part of any solution that you're using for this is being able to quickly rule out incorrect hypotheses. So as I talk through what happened here, I'll also talk through some of the things that we thought were happening and how we figured out that, that was not the correct explanation. So we got this report that a page load was slow. Um, we were hearing this from some customers. And the thing that we started with was looking at, here's some sort of vanilla time series where you're looking at a couple of different percentiles. So here, unlike the histograms before, now the latency is along the y-axis and we're looking at time progressing from left to right. There are a couple of different lines on this graph. There's a 50th percentile line, which is a little bit hard to see, but it's essentially flat along the bottom of this, this plot. And then there are some higher percentile lines, which you can see are looking a little bit more spiky. And there along the right side, um, there's a 90th percentile data point where things are taking 17 seconds. So this is much too slow for a page load. Now we started poking around um, and the first thing that we noticed is that there seemed to be some correlation where errors were happening at the same time as some of these slow page loads. So one of the first things that I did to debug this problem, so here, just to recap, the median latency was fine, but it was the high percentile latency that was a problem. And before I, uh, I dig into this hypothesis, um, I wanna share this piece of advice that somebody gave me back when I was getting my PhD and doing a lot of measurement. Uh, which is that they said, use your intuition to ask questions, not to answer them. I think this is something that's very helpful to think about when you're doing this kind of diagnosis. I think most engineers can come up with an explanation for just about any behavior that happens, no matter how strange the behavior is. It's very tempting to just come up with an intuitive explanation and then move forward with a fix. Like in that example, when what I've said so far, I had this hypothesis that the errors were causing the problem, and it was very tempting to just go and re-engineer our error code path to make it much faster. Unfortunately, these explanations are often wrong, so it's important to use your intuition to ask questions to say, is the slowness due to errors, rather than jumping to conclusions. So here I was wondering if the slowness was due to the errors, so I went to the latency histogram in Lightstep's live view, I knew which service was slow. In this case, it was this crouton service that I've searched for. And I started searching for errors to see, are there a bunch of errors happening in the system and can that help me explain what's going on? So I searched for this error equals true tag. Now at this point, I started seeing that there were a bunch of errors. There was this read row operation that seems to be erroring pretty frequently. Here you can see um, that in a period of a second, there were a number of errors that happened. 
And in this case, I had some background knowledge to know that read row was something that had been added recently. It wasn't part of the page load, but I knew that it was something related to a different feature that had been added recently. And I started to wonder if maybe the errors with that other feature were causing problems for the page load. In this case, the historical data was very helpful uh, because I knew that the feature had been turned on recently, so I could check to see, are these errors something that have been occurring for a long time, or did they just newly start occurring? So here in this next image, I've checked the compare two boxes for a bunch of different historical times, an hour ago, a day ago, and a week ago, to get these new layers on the histogram. And what I can see here now very easily is that these errors are not new. They're not something that I should be worried about. Um, so these historical errors have helped me separate the signal from the noise and rule out this possible explanation. So this slowness is not due to the errors. So going back to this time series uh, data, one thing that's very useful here for coming up with an explanation is this one slow page load. Here, the thing that I've moused over is a data point that's happened where the page load took 17.7 seconds this is in a time series plot that was generated with light step. And one thing that's useful is that I can click into this particular example to see exactly what happened for that particular slow page load. So I can get this full trace of what happened for the page load that was slow. And just to reiterate what this trace is showing, each one of these horizontal lines is a function call in my system. Here I've moused over the thing that's the slowest. This yellow line is showing the critical path. So just to quickly um, describe what the critical path means. There are often a bunch of things that are happening in parallel in the system, and LightStep will uh, try to tell you what is actually on the critical path. So the critical path is the only thing that's really important to optimize. Just as an example here, there are a bunch of these list histos with prefix calls that are all happening in parallel. There's the one I highlighted, but then there's another one below it. And the only one that can really help to optimize right now is that one slow one that's taking 17.7 seconds. If I tried to optimize those other faster ones, it wouldn't make a difference because my request is depending on that one slowest one. So here, clicking on this example, and I asked why is the page load taking 17 seconds, I was able to pretty quickly hone in on an explanation, which is that there's this one list call that's taking a long time that's causing the query to be slow. In this case, there was some optimization that we could do to fix the list call to make it much faster. And we redeployed the service and then asked, did we fix the latency or is the latency still slow? So this is that time series graph again. Around the middle, you can see the big spike that we looked at before where things were taking about 17 seconds. Now the latency looks maybe to have improved, but there are still uh, definitely some spikes where it's too high. For example, there's that new data point on the right-hand side where it's 12 seconds. So I'm back in the position of trying to come up with an explanation to understand what's going on with the latency. Now at this point, I've pivoted to looking at the histogram instead of looking at the time series. So here I'm looking at a live histogram of that same problematic operation that I'm concerned about. And this is an example that helps understand why the histogram is helpful. When I was looking back at that time series, all I could see was these high percentiles and that there were these occasional spikes. But when I look at the histogram, I can see that there are these kind of distinct clusters of behavior. There are a couple of slow outliers that are taking around 10 seconds. Then there's another group of behavior that's taking maybe sort of two or three seconds. And then the biggest mode, the biggest group of behavior is those ones that are kind of fast enough that I'm not concerned about, that are taking a few hundred milliseconds. So the histogram has kind of helped me in my explanation because it's grouped this huge amount of data into a couple of different things that I can independently triage. So one thing that I might do to triage this is I would start by focusing on just one of those slow bumps and ask what's unique about that particular bump or that particular mode of behavior. So here I filtered out only the traces in that cluster of behavior and I can click on one of them to try and understand what's going on. Now in this case, if I clicked on a bunch of them, one thing that I could see, first of all, is that the um, that slow list call is no longer along the critical path, so there's something else that's slow, and instead now there's this query call that's slow that's taking three seconds. If I clicked on a bunch of these traces, which I haven't shown in the slides, but what I would start to see is that there's a theme across all of these ones that are slow, which is that the project ID describes a particular important customer. Again, this is a value of being able to see the right kind of data, I've been able to hone in um, and see that there's a particular customer that's, that's clustered in this bad behavior. 
I won't show it here, but if I had zoomed in on that problematic behavior on the right side, what I would have seen is that there's a different customer that is characteristic of, of those flow data points on the right side. So I'm starting to get into this explanation that there's something about particular customers that's causing their behavior to be different. Now, continuing to explain, I can click on one of those very slow examples. Um, this is one of the examples that was taking more like four seconds and look through the trace to understand what's going on. And what I can start to see here is that the critical path is no longer along the list call. Instead, there are a bunch of these small calls that are relating to deserializing the data, uh, to taking the data from a string of bytes and converting it into data structures that we can use. And these large numbers of individually small calls are combining to make something that's very slow. So at this point, um, we did some refactoring of the system um, to avoid this. Now, reflecting on how this debugging process went, if I went back and looked at these time series data, one question that I might be tempted to ask is, could I have solved this problem if I just had more time series data? Would that data have helped? In the best case, if I had had more time series data, I would have had some metrics for the slow component. For example, in the beginning, when it was that list query that was slow, I would have had a metric that would have shown me that. Now, the problem with that is I would have had to have metrics for every function in my system, and I would have had to know which one I was looking for to try and debug this particular problem. Now, in the worst case, for the later example, where there were a large number of calls that individually were fast, but that were combining to make the whole query slow, I might not have found anything at all, because there wasn't some other uh, latency that would have spiked for some other component. Instead, it was really critical to see that entire trace, to get that one example of something that was slow, and look at everything about the behavior in order to understand what was going on. Reflecting a little bit more on why the histogram helped, the reason that the histogram helps is it because it gives you this sort of complete perfect view of all of the different groups of behavior in the system. For example, um, going back to these clusters of latency that are sometimes slow, I could compare the current histogram to an hour ago and see that, okay, these slow outliers weren't there an hour ago. And in this case, I now know it's because those customers that were slow were not sending queries an hour ago, and that helps me understand the reason for the slowness. To recap the takeaways from this example, the first is that these explanations are often iterative, that rejecting bad hypotheses is just as important as validating correct ones, and it's critical to have a solution that allows you to do that quickly. A second takeaway is that more data isn't necessarily better. The thing that helped me solve the problem was not looking at hundreds of time series graphs or reading all of the logs in my system. Instead, it was having the right examples so that I could reduce this vast amount of data about my system into a small number of things that would help me do root cause analysis and understand what was wrong. In particular, the histogram helped me cluster the different behaviors. The historical layers helped me reduce the set of explanations to rule out things that were wrong, explanations that were incorrect, and to hone in on exactly when the behavior changed. And finally, um, I was able to reduce the data by getting to the right trace. It wasn't just that I got any trace from my system. It was that there was a particular customer that was slow, and there were a couple of high latency outliers, and I could get a trace for exactly that behavior that I was interested in. Uh, so to recap this talk as a whole, um, not just the example, there are these two um, critical activities that users do when debugging their systems today. The first is to measure, and the second is to explain. These are both very difficult because of the complexity of today's systems and the huge value of data, the huge volume of data. So in order to do these things effectively, we argue that there are two things that make a huge difference. The first is having high precision measurement, so having these detailed latency histograms that show you all of the behavior in your system. And the second is better explanations, not just giving users more data, but giving them tools that help them steer them towards the root cause so they can sift through um, the huge amount of metrics that are being reported by their system. LightStep XPM is the only product we know of that brings it all together. Um, and I hope that you've enjoyed this talk today. I'm happy now to take any questions. All right, great. We've gotten a couple questions in so far, but uh, if you do have a question for Kay, don't delay. Go ahead and use your GoToWebinar control panel, submit your questions, and we'll go ahead and get started with them. First question, let's see. Um, so, okay, so having used other tracing and monitoring tools before, can you share a bit more on how LightStep is different? 
Yeah, sure. So the biggest way that light step is different is that we don't do filtering. So a lot of other tracing and monitoring tools will uh, sample in advance to decide, for example, which traces are useful. And hopefully one of the things that you took away from the example that I walked through is that it's not always easy to know in advance which trace is useful, but it is really important to get traces for things that happen rarely. Like in the example that I walked through, there were a couple of times when the page load was slow and it wouldn't have been helpful to get a random trace from the system. Really, I needed a trace from the time when it was slow. Um, and so this is the thing that's most different about LightStep is that we collect all of the data um, and we can show you a live trace from sort of any arbitrary behavior that you experienced in the system that you would like to debug. All right, great. Uh, next question, how complicated is the setup for these histogram layers? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're collecting a lot more data um, when we do this historical analysis to show you the histogram for any query that you look at. And luckily, this is something that we were able to do without adding any performance overhead to our system or without requiring any additional setup from users. This is something that we can show for any query and um, talking about the technical underpinnings of that is the subject of a whole other talk that I could give, um, but it's something that does not require any extra setup. All right, great. Next question, uh, let's see. Does microservices, ad do microservices adversely impact operating performance and management complexity? Yes, I think I would say absolutely in answer to that question because the more different services that you have, the more different ways that they can interact to cause problems. And not just to cause problems, but to cause things that look weird that might or might not be a problem. Um, and so this added complexity is why it's critical to have the right tools to get to the root cause explanations when things go wrong and not just feel like you're swimming in this huge amount of data reported by all of your services. All right. Great. Uh, let's see. Next question. Uh, how do you define latency? Uh, how do you, the question is, how do you define latency? So we usually define latency as the time it takes to complete a particular operation from when it started to when it completed. Um, and then typically people, are, as I described, people are actually interested in some distribution over that. Um, so in looking at a collection of latencies that happened over time. Okay. All right, great. So next question, uh, do we need to instrument the application for capturing the metrics? And could you please elaborate more on how to integrate my application to XPM? Yeah, sure. So LightStep relies on an open source piece of software called Open Tracing that's used to do the instrumentation. So this is not something that's specific to LightStep. And if you instrument your software with Open Tracing, you can use those metrics in a number of different tools uh, light step is one example of something that you could use. But yes, um, you do have to do instrumentation yourself um, in order to start reporting some of this information. All right, great. Um, just a reminder to the audience, uh, if you have a question for Kay, uh, please go ahead and use your webinar control panel, get that in. Um, while we're waiting for more questions to come in, I do want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded or is being recorded. So if you uh, missed any of it or all of it, um, you will be able to access the webinar on demand. We'll be sending out an email that has a link to the webinar uh, so that you can listen to it at your leisure. Um, the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website. Uh, you can just go to the webinars tab on DevOps.com, click on the on demand section and it will be there. We've got a ton of other webinars over there. So take a look around and uh, maybe there'll be one or two others that pique your interest. Okay, All right, it's looking like that is pretty much, uh, those, those are the questions that we've gotten from the audience. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and close it out then and give everybody a few minutes back in their day. Kate Osterhaus, thank you so much for such a great presentation. I, I appreciate it. I'm sure the audience does as well. Thanks, Charlene. Great. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you to the audience for joining us today. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon signing off. Have a great day, everybody.